again, this is Eric, Program Coordinator for the Spurs Dual Credit Program. With me now is Todd Battistelli, who is an instructor at the University of Texas. He teaches rhetoric and writing classes, including the 306 class that you're currently engaged in. He's also one of three assistant directors in the Division of Rhetoric and Writing, so he has additional responsibilities, um, including building some of the curriculum that you're using right now. So I'm going to turn it over to him to talk about counter-arguments. Todd? Thank you, Eric. For a few moments, I'm going to dim the lights so we can see what's on the screen. And up there, you can see a general description of the types and purposes of counterarguments that you might come across either in articles you're reading or in the writing you might do. And you see here, counterarguments can be used for a couple of purposes. One is to respond to arguments that other people have already made. And the other is to anticipate objections to arguments that you are making in a paper. And in general, there are two types of counterargument. One is to explain why your position offers a better argument than other arguments out there. And the other is to look closely at another argument and explain why it is wrong. And for some examples, we're going to take a look at the essay published by Senator Dick Durbin. I will turn the lights on again. I'll be reading some quotes from Senator Durbin's essay, and I'll reference the paragraph numbers. And overall, you'll note that Dick Durbin's Making the Dream Act a Reality essay is a response to the law passed in Arizona, which makes police responsible for enforcing immigration. And you'll note that in the very beginning of his essay, he makes a counterargument where he explains what is wrong with that law. But most of his essay is not dedicated to explaining what's wrong. Most of his essay is dedicated to explaining his alternative and why it is a better option than the types of laws that they see in Arizona. So first, to look at that strategy of talking about what's wrong in another argument. You see in the first paragraph, he's addressing the Arizona law. And Senator, the first paragraph, I have serious concerns about the fairness and constitutionality of the Arizona law. And then, in the second paragraph, he says, putting police in a position of enforcing this law is unfair in light of our own failure to act in Washington. And those are really the only places in the essay where he talks about what's wrong with laws like those passed in Arizona. And the rest of his essay is dedicated to a counterargument that spells out what's right about his alternative. And his alternative is the Dream Act. Looking at paragraph six, he starts to list multiple benefits of the DREAM Act and why the DREAM Act is a better alternative than laws like those in Arizona. He says that the bill would give immigrant students the chance to become legal residents. He says in paragraph seven that it will allow a generation of immigrant students with great potential and ambitions to contribute more fully to society. He talks about how our country would benefit from thousands of highly qualified, well-educated young people who are eager to serve in the armed forces during a time of war. So in those two paragraphs, he lists multiple positive criteria, reasons why his argument is better than other arguments. There are some benefits to opting for counter-argument in terms of what's good as opposed to arguing what's wrong with other people, especially for a politician like the senator. Often people think politicians are too negative or too argumentative. And by focusing on the positive aspects of the DREAM Act, Senator Durbin's able to avoid that sort of stereotype of the politician as only looking for arguments and fights. And instead, he's offering solutions. At the very end of his essay, he uses the other purpose of counterargument, where he anticipates an objection. In that last paragraph, paragraph number 12, he says, I understand some would rather avoid this issue in an election year because it is politically sensitive, but Congress has an obligation to do what is best for our country and fix our broken immigration system. So here he's anticipating an objection. He says, some people might say that I'm wrong. They might say that this is the wrong time to address the DREAM Act. 
but he responds to that objection and he explains why that position is wrong. He says, it's the time to do it now because we in Congress have the responsibility to act. This is something to think about when you're working on your own essays. It may sound wrong to raise potential objections to your position. You may think that the best course of action would be to write as strong of argument as you can and not mention any potential drawbacks. But in fact, the opposite is true. When you mention other arguments, potential objections to your position, and can address them and show why they ultimately do not undermine your point, you are making a stronger argument. So that's a brief discussion of counterarguments and how they might function in both sources you read and in essays you write. And with that, I say thank you.